Yeah, good afternoon. We're going to start the meeting. Uh, I'm Councilman Peter Ku, and I'm the chair of the Committee on Technology. At today's hearing, the committee will vote on resolution number 620, sponsored by Councilmember Moyer and myself at the request of the Manhattan Borough President, uh, Gail Brewer. Resolution number 620 calls on the Federal Communications Commission to reject the proposed rules put forth in the second third notice of proposed rulemaking 18-131 and to create provisions that would strengthen public educational and governmental assets uh, television. Public educational and governmental assets television is an important resource for our local communities and city as a whole. I specifically want to highlight my local community television center, Queen's Public Television. Queen's Public Television, also known as QPTV, is a vital resource for Queen's residents and cable classes, the most diverse programming to the most diverse community in the world. They won a bulletin board that highlights events from over 140 organizations in our borough, provide training, production tools, and resources for Queen's residents and nonprofits, and allow our residents to exercise their First Amendment rights. Our pub, uh, other public stations like BronzeNet and Manhattan's MNN are also very established stations with local news and talk shows that have become the go-to outlets for hyper-local, borough-specific NYC news. The FCC's proposed rules would remove this delicate stream of funding from QPTV and others, and it will severely hinder their ability to cablecast the day's events, news, and important community information. All of our local public education and governmental access channels will be impacted by this proposed change. We, we should be protecting these channels as the conduits for the principles of free speech as they are the last two public television stations. They are not relying, relying on advertising or politics the public should have the access to broadcast channels without these stations. Uh, without these stations leading to compete for funding. I ask my colleagues to help protect these channels. At this point, I would like to invite uh, our first panel, council member, uh, no, council member, former council member, yeah, Gail Brewer, uh, now is borough president uh, of Manhattan to speak about resolution number 620. And I would like to recommend the members of this committee uh, to vote in favor of the re resolution. Thank you. Mm. And we, before uh, borough president start, we want to acknowledge the presence of our committee members, uh, Council Member Ehrlich, Co uh, Council Member Holden, and Council Member Yeager. Gail, um, Board President, uh, you can state your name and start. Yeah. Thank you very much. I am Gail Brewer. I am the Manhattan Borough President. I am the former council member, and I am honored to be here today. And I want to thank you, Chairman Ku, and Council Member Moya, and all the members who are here today. I want to thank Council Member Moya and Ku particularly for uh, sponsoring Resolution 620. And as the chair indicated, the Federal Communications Commission uh, you know, we're urging, this resolution urges them to reject the rules put forth by the second further notice of proposed rulemaking 18-131. And what that means is something that you probably know, something new from the Trump administration, which is that the new restrictions proposed by the FCC, which is the Federal Communications Commission, would count services. This is the crux of the whole issue. It would count the services that New York City negotiated 
four in cable franchising agreements, and I think some of us have been through those agreements, whether it is Time Warner or Verizon or other cable franchises. We negotiated these cable franchising agreements and fees which fund our public, our educational, and our governmental access channels, known as PEGs, toward the existing 5% cap on cable franchising fees. That's the crux of it. And so by um, proposing these restrictions, to me it's an attack on local government by the FCC, headed up by Chair P uh, Pai, and the Trump administration as they look to line the pockets of cable companies at the expense of these important services that the PEGs provide. And the PEGs are really important to our community. You'll hear from them. But these organizations train nearly 10,000 people a year in video production and editing, graphics, sound, and lighting. They all provide facilities, technical support, equipment, and free channel time. And they give people representing diverse communities an audience and a voice. I know Manhattan Neighborhood Network well, MNN, but I know the others are also terrific in the five boroughs. But MNN is the largest media educator in our city, serving more than 1,200 media students every year. It is also the single largest cable caster of original content in the United States. It airs 15,000 hours from 1,000 producers. In general, the majority of the PEGS funding comes from the rates negotiated in the cable franchising agreements that I mentioned earlier. These revised rules would have a significant impact on PEGS budget and ability to provide this very needed service in our community. The new restrictions would also prevent local franchising authorities from negotiating for a percentage of revenue generated by the internet services that cable corporations provide which further endangers the future of pegs as cord cutting becomes more and more common. Between July and September of this year, 2018, nearly 1.1 million people canceled their subscriptions with cable and satellite TV providers, according to Moffat Nathanson, a media and telecommunications research firm here in Manhattan. And I, I'm a, I think anybody under, any millennial, you're all cutting your cable, don't do that. That's my opinion. The Lightman Research Group has reported 12% of American households have cut the cord since 2013. And again, I'm not surprised. So we know that cable revenues will suffer in the future as internet streaming becomes more popular. In order to ensure the future of pegs, we must be able to tap into the growing revenues cable corporations generate from internet service, which relies on the same hardware and public property as their pay TV packages. That's what the FCC should be focusing on. Restricting local government's ability to regulate non-cable services is not only a direct threat to the future of pegs, it also impacts the city's ability to protect New Yorkers. The city must be able to pass laws that provide constituents with privacy and consumer protections that apply to internet service providers. Large corporations have mishandled and misused consumer data. We all read recently about the data breaches at Marriott, Dunkin' Donuts, and Dell. 500 million consumers impacted very recently. Despite the FCC's claim that these rules would reduce barriers to entry and promote competition, in my opinion, they intentionally and significantly reduce costs for incumbent cable TV operators. I firmly believe that these proposed rules will more firmly entrench existing companies and dissuade competition. Finally, from my perspective, there's nothing in these proposed rules which provides any measurable benefit to New Yorkers, and I think you'll hear the same from the pegs. And I just want to mention that the city of New York benefits tremendously from the work that the pegs have done and also from their own support as a result of the franchise negotiations. So there's nothing in these proposed rules which provides any benefit to New Yorkers, and the rules threaten to destroy one of the most important ecosystems that we have of small, local, original programming 
and information services to underserved communities. So I thank you very much for your sponsorship, and I appreciate that this resolution is being introduced. It's not the front page of every newspaper, but it is something that I think is important to our communities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul President. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, now we will call the second panel, uh, Mr. Great Shutton, Anthony Riddle, and Audrey Duncan. Uh, you may start after stating your name. Anyone can start first. Yeah. My name is Greg Sutton, the Managing Director of Access Services of the Manhattan Neighborhood Network. And I thank the members of the City Council for the opportunity to voice MNN support for resolution number 0620-2018. MNN agrees wholeheartedly that the actions proposed by the Federal Communications Commission, if adopted, would significantly harm the public access programming serving the people of the City of New York with no offsetting public benefits. Last month, MNN filed comments with the FCC in strong opposition, and we thank the City of New York for also filing comments opposing the FCC's misguided proposals. As this council may be aware, MNN operates the public access channels in Manhattan and is currently one of the largest cable casters of original video programming in the United States. MNN's vision is to empower local voices and diverse views of New Yorkers from all political, socioeconomic, and cultural perspectives. Its programming is in multiple languages and serves the gorgeous mosaic that is in New York City. It does so by offering media distribution services, video production facilities, and media education to Manhattan residents and community-based organizations who deliver high-quality and hyper-local programming to Manhattan's cable subscribers. MNN collaborates with many other video content providers. Our next.nyc cable and digital channel highlights local community groups that are changing lives and making a difference. They include the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater, Big Brothers, Big Sisters of New York City, the Children's Museum of the Arts, Girls Who Code, the Harlem Arts Festival, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, and the New York Anti-Traffic Network. But for the MNN public access channels, many cable subscribers, especially who were physically challenged or lacked the financial means, would have no access to this vital city programming. There's no other outlet that can accommodate the broad range of ethnic, religious, and cultural programming that is presented on the public access channels at no cost to the producers. MNN also invests in training residents and lo local community organizations in all aspects of video production and provides low cost access to production equipment and facilities. MNN educates more than 1,200 media students annually in courses ranging from digital editing, field camera, and studio production. Many of the MNN video producers are, for com are from communities that have no access to high quality media equipment and services. MNN public access programming gives voice to diverse perspectives that simply cannot be found anywhere else on today's commercial cable TV channels. The FCC's proposals threaten to gut funding for public access in this city and in cities and communities across the country. The effects of its proposed ruling would be a devastating blow to diversity, inclusion, and freedom of expression. And the FCC proposes to do so by illegally stripping the city of the statutory authority given to it by Congress in Section 621 of the Communications Act. In 1984, Congress deliberately chose to provide local franchising authorities, not the FCC, with the authority to require cable TV operators to support public, educational, and governmental access programming as a condition of granting the valuable privilege of holding a city cable franchise. 
Decades after Congress enacted the law, however, the FCC seeks to rip that authority away from the city. I'll not repeat here the many legal arguments raised by m and the city and associations and individuals across the country as to why the FCC's proposed actions would violate the Federal Communications Act. I will note, however, that the FCC essentially misinterprets the plain meaning of phrase franchise fee to sweep in for the first time all costs of PEG access within the 5% statutory cap. But as the FCC itself has conceded, not all franchise obligations are franchise fees. Like a franchise build out obligation, the PEG obligations give back to the subscribers directly with valuable local programming they add value to the cable network itself, and they enhance the market demand for the cable operator's channel lineup. The FCC turns a blind eye to these critical facts. Why did the FCC do this? How did it get this so wrong? Well, it's not really clear. What is very clear from over 2,000 comments already filed with the FCC is how completely wrong it got the law and the policy with no offsetting benefit other than to increase the cash pockets of cable franchises. m and urges this council to send a strong message of support for diversity and inclusion in New York City by adopting Resolution 0620-2018. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker. Hello, I'm Audrey Duncan. I'm Director of Training and Special Projects at BronxNet. We want to thank the City Council for allowing us to voice our support for resolution number 0620-2018. BronxNet provides public services with current studios and network operations located at Lehman College and our Constellation site located in the East Bronx at Mercy College. BronxNet's multimedia production studios in the South Bronx are currently being constructed as part of La Centrale in the hub. Through BronxNet's public access facilities, we train the public in media production by providing television, studio, and field production workshops. We provide access to technology and help students acquire valuable workforce development skills. Graduates of our workshops utilize media production equipment at no cost to produce programs and share diverse ultra-local content that contributes to community development through media. BronxNet strongly opposes the tentative conclusion in the FMPRM that cable-related in-kind contributions such as those that allow our programming to be viewed on the cable system are franchise fees. Using fair market value to determine the amount to be considered a franchise fee will lead to arbitrary deductions and would have adverse effects on our budget and, ul and ultimately our ability to serve the people of the Bronx. The programming that you find on BronxNet, you will not find anywhere else on your cable channel lineup. So far, BronxNet has achieved the following results. Over 350,000 broadcasts of independent programs have been produced by Bronx residents, and in most cases, the programs were produced with equipment and facilities provided by BronxNet. Over 5,000 Bronx residents have been trained to produce studio and field-based programs through our intensive eight-week certification workshops. Over 3,000 high school and college students have gained experience through hands-on internships in production, management, engineering, and more. As a result, many have acquired competitive positions at scores of national and local media outlets. Hundreds of Bronx organizations and hundreds more across New York City have utilized BronxNet's signature public affairs programs as platforms to share important information about services, activities, and issues that are important to Bronx families and communities. BronxNet provides coverage of arts and culture along with innovative local arts programming. BronxNet also helps local artists and arts organizations build support and audiences while fueling ec economic engines and contributing to the creative economy. As times and technology change, BronxNet works to stay cutting edge as we enhance our public services in the Bronx. We're building on our strong record of providing workforce opportunities to high school and college students. Also, high school students interning at BronxNet have demonstrated improved academic achievement. And we recently started working with junior high school students, middle 
high school students to help them prepare for a world of possibilities they may not have iman imagined. We, we reject the implication in the FNPRM that PEG programming is for the benefit of the local franchising authority or a third party PEG provider rather than for the public or the cable consumer. As indicated above, BronxNet provides valuable local programming that is not otherwise available on the cable system or in other modes of video delivery such as satellite, including programs that allow residents to remotely participate in live discussions on important community topics. Yet the commission tentatively concludes that non-capital PEG requirements should be considered franchise fees because they are in essence taxes imposed for the benefit of local franchising authority or the designated PEG providers. By contrast, the FNPRM tentatively concludes that build out requirements are not franchise fees because they are not contributions to the franchising authority. PEG programming fits squarely into the category of benefits that do not accrue to the local franchising authority or its designated access provider. Yet the commission concludes without any discussion of the public benefits of local programming that non-capital PEG related provisions benefit the local franchising authority or its designee rather than the public at large. It is important to consider how media literacy, access to broadband and technology, and related skills are increasingly more essential for, for participation in contemporary civic and economic life, and how community access organizations like BronxNet are anchor institutions serving a critical role in the technological future of the Bronx and our great city. Thank you again for this opportunity to address the council. Thank you, Ms. Duncan. Now we have uh, Mr. Anthony Riddle. Yes, thank you, um, Mr. Chair. I'm Anthony Riddle. I'm the Vice President for Community Media at BRIC. BRIC is a downtown arts organization in Brooklyn, the largest presenter of free or almost free programming and an incubator of artists, including media artists here in New York. Um, we are strongly in favor of the resolution before you today, and we strongly oppose the tentative conclusion in the um, FNPRM that cable-related in-kind contributions, such as those that allow community programming to be viewed in the cable system, are franchise fees. This is in direct contradiction to the original language and congressional intent of the law and contra contrary to decades of practice. I'd um, like to paint a little picture with some numbers for you of what we do. Uh, we reach over 600,000 homes in Brooklyn alone. Uh, we have four cable providers, all of them that are in the city. We, um, we have ratings that show us that we have more than 5 million views of our programs per year. Um, the programs are produced by 550 local series producers per quarter. We operate five studios. We have seven locations throughout the borough uh, outside of our main location at the Brooklyn Public Libraries. Um, we have dozens of camera packages which we provide to the public for free. We train over 5,000 students per year, including uh, young people at 42 public schools in Brooklyn. I had to ask about this one. I couldn't quite remember, but it seems like we have 10 Emmy Awards uh, here in New York. I wasn't quite sure what the number was because you start forgetting after a while. Um, but that's after dozens of nominations in the most competitive market in the country, uh, which casts a lie to the idea that, that public access is not a quality programming source. Um, our, our Brick TV has been included in at least a dozen major film festivals, including both Sundance and Tribeca. Our meaningful and important work for the community is almost entirely dependent upon our financial agreements with the cable companies. Without them, our services to the public would cease to exist. It is not fair to allow these massively profitable companies to determine an arbitrary free market va fair market value for in-kind services when the people who own this valuable public right-of-way are arbitrarily prevented from charging fair market value for the use of the right-of-way. I'd like to talk about a couple of programs that we have. We have a program we're very proud of called Project Redirect with the Brooklyn DA's office where we work um, with the DA's office uh, with young offenders to give them the opportunity not only to eliminate the felony uh, that they have on their record, but to discover who they are through the use of video um, courses and video equipment. Um, we also have a program uh, with Made in New York and SBS for um, the Made in New York production training program, wherein um, people are taught 
up to a level where they can enter the robust uh, filmmaking market here in New York. It's a very intense program that requires a, um, uh, a lot of work and there's job placement afterwards. But what's interesting is we have both of these programs, Project Redirect and Made in New York, in our facility and that allowed us to introduce the parties in both programs. So now some of the students who are in the DA's program are given the opportunity to uh, get job related skills through the Made in New York program. So we have sort of, uh, um, uh, we have a, a pipeline to work that comes out of the work that we do. We, we reject the implication in the FNPRM that PEG programming is for the benefit of local franchising authority or a third party PEG provider, provider rather than the, for the public or the cable consumer. In fact, we provide a source of programming that is a significant factor in the consumer choice to subscribe to cable rather than competitive systems. We are a primary source of local news and loyalty and goodwill for the cable companies. The commission concludes as um, my colleague said, without any discussion of the public benefits of local programming that non-capital PEG related provisions benefit the LFA or its designee rather than the public at large or the cable company. Tell that to the guests of Adopting Teens and Tweens, a program which interviews older young people in need of a family and home and which has on several occasions resulted in the adoption of those uh, who appeared on the program. We stand with the city of New York in opposition to this poorly drawn and dangerous rewrite of decades of law and practice. Thank you for allowing us the chance to talk to you. Thank you. Now, um, any questions? No, no. Oh, so you can raise us down. Thank you. Uh, before we go to vote, uh, we have Council Member Moyer, and Council Moyer will give a statement before the vote. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to my colleagues um, for giving me this opportunity. Um, in late September, the Federal Communications uh, Commission released the second notice of a proposed rulemaking 18-131. If enacted, uh, this proposal would introduce new restrictions on local franchising authorities with regards to cable franchising agreements and regulation of non-cable services. Ultimately, the proposal amounts to little more than a meaningless handout to cable companies while kneecapping our public educational and governmental programming. Uh, it's no surprise that this FCC proposal is nothing more than just a naked handout to corporate giants. Uh, this is the Trump administration's FCC, after all, and an administration that has allowed net neutrality to die, effectively selling uh, our internet services to the highest bidder. This rule change that would severely limit New York City's ability to negotiate cable franchise agreements uh, to benefit uh, our local public, uh, specifically with regards to local public uh, access networks like the Manhattan Neighborhood Network being one of them, which provides uh, public education and governmental programs also known as PEGs. Currently, franchise fees for cable providers are capped at no more than 5% of the cable TV's operator's annual gross revenue. As part of the agreement New York City negotiated, cable companies count pegs as in-kind contributions to the city. If the FCC adopts this proposal, cable companies would count the dollar value of those in-kind services against the 5% cap on the franchise fee. This would reduce the revenue that would be directed to peg channels under our current franchise agreement, and it would also preclude local governments from charging cable uh, providers a percentage for revenue from non-cable services. This would devastate the public access television organizations like the Manhattan Neighborhood Network and others. Uh, in addition to being the city's largest nonprofit media educator, uh, the Manhattan Neighborhood Network also serves more than 1,200 students every year and airs 15,000 hours of original content from more than 1,000 contributors. Uh, this potential kneecapping of independent media comes at a time when our city is already increasingly starved for news, uh, news sources uh, with the disbanding of DNA info and the continual layoffs of outlets like the New York Daily News. The FCC's pr proposal is a flagrant overreach by the federal government and paralyzes the authority of the municipalities to negotiate their own franchise agreements. This from the administration of a president whose own party starts and ends the sentence with states' rights. Not only that, these rules change are also uh, are absurd. 
the cable giants, the potential profits that they turn would be nominal at best, but to PEGS, the money is vital. If enacted, these rules would cripple public programming. These rules benefit no one, save only those who benefit from a less informed and engaged public. And this proposal is yet another example of this administration's embrace of corporate interest and its compulsive betrayal of the public good. Uh, this is why I've introduced a resolution along with uh, the great borough president of Manhattan, Gail Brewer, who's here today, uh, to condemn uh, the Trump administration's move to gut cable access channels and nullify the ability of local governments in negotiating their own franchise agreements. And with that, uh, I encourage my colleagues to join in condemning this proposal, and I thank you once again, Chair, for allowing me to come and read my statement, and thank you to my colleagues as well. Thank you, Councilmember Moyer. Are there any more public uh, members who want to uh, participate in this public forum? Seeing none? You have one more? Uh, did you sign up? Yes, I did. Oh. Uh, Mr. Jacobs? I'm not going to actually speak, but I just want to report some comments that my colleagues from the Bronx or from the Bronx made. And thank you for your comments acknowledging the work of Phoenix Public Television and Bronx Entertainment. And I submit those comments. Oh, I see. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. So, seeing none, uh, we're going to proceed to vote. Uh, with the clerk, uh, please uh, make the vote. Uh, roll call. No roll call. The vote. Lee Martin, committee clerk, roll call vote committee on technology, resolution 620, Chair Ku. Uh, I will aye. Holden. Aye. Yeager. Aye. Ulrich. I vote aye and ask my name be added as a co sponsor to the resolution. Thank you. By a vote of four in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions. Resolution has been adopted by the committee. So thank you very much uh, for the public and, and also all the members of this committee. Thank you. Uh, the meeting is adjourned. We're going to... Uh, We're going to hold the meeting open for 15 more minutes for a member to come to vote. Yeah, thank you.